Another Ray Bradbury story for the author's birthday, The Whole Town Sleeping. It was a warm summer night in the middle of Illinois County. Country. The little town was deep, far away from everything. Kept to itself by a river and a forest and a ravine. In the town, the sidewalks were still scorched. The stores were closing and the streets were turning dark. There were two moons, a clock moon with four faces and four night directions above the solemn black courthouse, and the real moon that was slowly rising in vanilla whiteness from the dark east. In the downtown drugstore, fans whispered in the high ceiling air. In the Rococo shade of porches, invisible people sat. On the purple bricks of the summer twilight streets, children ran. Screen doors whined their springs and banged. The heat was breathing from the dry leaves and trees. On her solitary porch, Lavinia Nebs, aged 37, very straight and slim, sat with a tinkling lemonade in her white fingers, tapping it at her lips, waiting. Here I am, Lavinia. Lavinia turned. There was Francine at the bottom porch step. In the smell of zinnias and hibiscus, Francine was all in snow white and she didn't look 35. Miss Lavinia Net, or her name's Lavina, sorry. Miss Lavina Nebs rose and locked her front door, leaving her lemonade glass standing half empty on the porch rail. It's a fine night for the movie. Where are you going, ladies? cried Grandma ha- Hanlon from her shadowy porch across the street. They called back to the soft ocean of darkness to the elite theater to see Harold Lloyd in Welcome Danger. Won't catch me out on no night like this, wailed Grandma Hanlon. Not with the lonely ones strangling women. Lock myself in with my gun, Grandma's door slammed and locked. The two maiden ladies drifted on. Lavinia felt the warm breath of the summer night shimmering off the oven-baked sidewalk. It was like walking on a hard crust of freshly warmed bread. The heat pulsed under your dress and along your legs with a stealthy sense of invasion. Lavinia, you don't believe all that gossip about... Sorry, I keep saying Lavinia, it's Lavina. Lavina, you don't believe all that gossip about the lonely one, do you? Those women just like to see their tongues dance. Just the same, Hattie McDollis was killed a month ago and Roberta Ferry the month before, and now Ella Ramsey has disappeared. Hattie McDullis walked off with a traveling man, I bet. But the others strangled, four of them, their tongues sticking out their mouths, they say. They stood on the edge of the ravine that cut the town in two. Behind them were the lighted houses and faint radio music. Ahead was deepness, moistness, fireflies, and dark. Maybe we shouldn't go to the movie, said Francine. The lonely one might follow and kill us. I don't like that ravine. Look how black... Look how black. Smell it and listen. The ravine was a dynamo that never stopped running, day or night. There was a great moving hum among the secret mists and washed shales and the odors of a rank greenhouse. Always the black dynamo was humming with green electrical, with green electric sparkles where fireflies hovered. And it won't be me, said Francine, coming back through the terrible dark ravine tonight late. It'll be you, Levina, you down the steps and over that rickety bridge, and maybe the lonely one standing behind a tree. I'd never have gone over to church this afternoon if I had to walk through here all alone, even in daylight. Bosh, said Levina Nebs. It is Lavinia. So it'll be Lavinia for the rest of the story. It'll be you alone on the path, listening listening to your shoes, not me. And shadows, you all alone on you all alone on the way back home, Lavinia Lavinia. Don't you get lonely living by yourself in that house? Old maids love to live alone, said Lavinia. She pointed to a hot, shadowy path. Let's walk the shortcut. I'm afraid. It's early. The lonely one won't be out till late. Lavinia, as cool as mint ice cream, took the other woman's arm and led her down the dark, winding path into cricket warmth and frog sound and mosquito-delicate silence. 
Let's run, gasped Francine. No. If Lavinia had turned her head just then, she wouldn't have seen it. But she did turn her head, and it was there. And then Francine looked over, and she saw it too. And they stood there on the path, not believing what they saw. In the singing deep night, back among a clump of bushes, half hidden but laid out, as if she had been put as if she had put herself down there to enjoy the soft stars, lay Eliza Ramsell. Francine screamed. The woman lay as if she were floating there, her face moon freckled, her eyes like white marble, her tongue clamped in her lips. Lavinia felt the ravine turning like a gigantic black merry go round underfoot. Francine was gasping and choking, and a long while later, Lavinia heard herself say, we'd better get the police. Hold me, Lavinia. Please hold me. I'm cold, though I've never been so cold since winter. Lavinia held Francine, and the policemen were all around in the ravine grass. Flashlights darted about. Voices mingled, and the night grew toward 8.30. It's like December. I need a sweater, said Francine, eyes shut against Lavinia's shoulder. The policeman said, I guess you can go now, ladies. You might drop by the station tomorrow for a little more questioning. Lavinia and Francine walked away from the police and the delicate sheet-covered thing on the ravine grass. Lavinia felt her heart going loudly within her, and she was cold, too, with a February cold. There were bits of sudden snow all over her flesh, and the moon washed her brittle fingers whiter, and she remembered doing all the talking while Francine just sobbed. A police voice called, "'You want an escort, ladies?' No, we'll make it, said Lavinia, and they walked on. I can't remember anything now, she thought. I can't remember how she looked lying there or anything. I don't believe it happened. Already I'm forgetting. I'm making myself forget. I've never seen a dead person before, said Francine. Lavinia looked at her wristwatch, which seemed impossibly far away. It's only 8.30. We'll pick up Helen and get on to the show. The show! It's what we need. Lavinia, you don't mean it. We've got to forget this. It's not good to remember. But Eliza's back there now, and we need to laugh. We'll go on to the show as if nothing happened. But Eliza was once your friend, my friend. We can't help her. We can only help ourselves forget. I insist. I won't go home and brood over it. I won't think of it. I'll fill my mind with everything else but... They started up the side of the ravine on a stony path in the dark. They heard voices and stopped. Below, near the creek waters, a voice was murmuring, I am the lonely one. I am the lonely one. I kill people. And I'm Eliza Ramsey. Look, and I'm dead. See my tongue and my mouth? See? Francine shrieked. You there, children, you nasty children, go home, get out of the ravine, you hear me? Get home, get home, get home. The children fled from their game. The night swallowed their laughter away up the distant hills into the warm darkness. Francine sobbed and walked on. I thought you ladies had never come, Helen Greer tapped her foot atop her porch steps. You're only an hour late, that's all. We started Francine. Lavinia clutched her arm. There was a commotion someone there was a commotion. Someone found Eliza Ramsey dead in the ravine. Helen gasped. Who found her? We don't know. The three maiden ladies stood in the summer night looking at one another. I've got a notion to lock myself in my house, said Helen at last. But finally she went to fetch a sweater, and while she was gone, Francine whispered frantically, Why didn't you tell her? Why upset her? Time enough tomorrow, replied Lavinia. The three women moved along the street under the black trees through a town that was slamming and locking doors, pulling down windows and shades and turning on blazing lights. They saw eyes peering out of them from curtained windows. How strange, thought Lavinia Nebs. The ice cream night, the popsicles dropped in puddles of lime and chocolate where they fell when the children were scooped indoors. Baseballs and bats lie upon the unfootprinted lawns. A half-drawn white chalk hopscotch line is there on the steamed sidewalk. We're crazy out on a night like this, said Helen. Lonely one can't kill three ladies, said Lavinia. There's safety in numbers. Besides, it's too soon. The murders never come less than a month apart. A shadow fell across their faces. A figure loomed. 
As if someone had struck an organ a terrible blow, the three women shrieked. Got you! The man jumped from behind a tree. Rearing into the moonlight, he laughed. Leaning over the tree, he laughed again. Hey, I'm the... The lonely one! Tom Dillon. Tom. Tom, said Lavinia, if you ever do a childish thing like that again, may you be riddled with bullets by mistake. Francine began to cry. Tom Dillon stopped smiling. Hey, I'm sorry. Haven't you heard about Eliza Ramsell? Snapped Lavinia. She's dead and you scaring women? You should be ashamed. Don't speak to us again. Ah, he moved to follow them. Stay right there, Mr. Lonely One, and scare yourself, said Lavinia. Go see Eliza Ramsell's face and see if it's funny. She pushed the other two on along the street of trees and, and stars, Francine holding a handkerchief to her face. Francine, pleaded Helen. It was only a joke. Why is she crying so hard? I guess we better tell you, Helen. We found Eliza, and it wasn't pretty, and we're trying to forget. We're going to the show to help, and let's not talk about it. Enough's enough. Get your ticket money ready. We're almost downtown. The drugstore was a small pool of sluggish air, which the great wooden fan stirred in tides of arnica and tonic and soda smell out of the brick streets, out into the brick streets. A nickel's worth of green mint chews, said Lavinia to the druggist. His face was set and pale, like all the faces they had seen on the half-empty streets. For eating in the show, she explained as the druggist dropped the mints into a sack with a silver shovel. Sure looked pretty tonight, said the druggist. You looked cool this noon, Miss Lavinia, when you was in here for chocolates, so cool and nice that someone asked about you. Oh, you're getting popular, man sitting at the counter. He rustled a few more mints in the sack, watched you walk out and said to me, Say, who's that? Man in a dark suit, thin pale face. Why, that's Lavinia Nebs. Prettiest maiden lady in town, I said. Beautiful, he said. Where does she live? Here the druggist paused and looked away. You didn't, wailed Francine. You didn't give him your address, I hope. Her address, I hope. You didn't. Sorry, I guess I didn't think. I said over on Park Street, you know, near the ravine. Casual remark, but now tonight them finding the body. I heard it a minute ago. I suddenly thought, what have I done? He handed over the package, much too full. You fool, cried Francine, and tears were in her eyes. I'm sorry, of course, maybe it was nothing. Nothing, nothing, said Francine. Lavinia stood with the three people looking at her, staring at her. She didn't know what or how to feel. She felt nothing, except perhaps the slightest prickle of excitement in her throat. She held out her money automatically. No charge on those peppermints, the druggist turned down his eyes and shuffled some papers. Well, I know what we're going to do right now, Helen stalked out of the drug shop. We're going right straight home. I'm not going to be part of any hunting party for you, Lavinia. That man was asking for you. You're next. You want to be dead in that ravine? It was just a man, said Lavinia slowly, eyes on the streets. So Tom Dillon's a man, but maybe he's the lonely one. We're all overwrought, said Lavinia reasonably. I won't miss the movie now. If I'm the next victim, let me be the next victim. A lady has has all too little excitement in her life, especially an old maid, a lady of 37 like me. So don't you mind if I enjoy it. And I'm being sensible. Stands to reason he won't be out tonight, so soon after a murder. A month from now, yes, when the police have relaxed and when he feels an, like another murder. You've got to feel like murdering people, you know. At least that kind of murderer does, and he's just resting up now. And anyway, I'm not going home to stew in my own juices. But Eliza's face there in the ravine. After the first look, I never looked again. I didn't, dr I didn't drink it in, if that's what you mean. I can see a thing and tell myself I never saw it. That's how strong I am. And the whole argument's silly anyhow, because I'm not beautiful. Oh, but you are, Lavinia. You're the loveliest maiden lady in town now that Eliza's... Francine stopped. If you'd only relaxed... You'd have been, you'd be married, you'd been married years ago. Stop sniveling, Francine. Here's the box office. You and Helen go on home. I'll sit, sit alone and go home alone. Lavinia, you're crazy. We can't leave you here. They argued for five minutes. Helen started to walk away, but came back when she saw Lavinia thump down her money. 
for a solitary movie ticket. Helen and Francine followed her silently into the theater. The first show was over in the dim auditorium as they sat in the odor of ancient brass polish. The manager appeared before the warm red velvet curtains for an announcement. The police have asked for an early closing tonight so everyone can be home at a decent hour. So we are cutting our short subjects and putting on our feature film again now. The show will be over at 11. Everyone's advised to go straight home and not linger on the streets. Our police force is pretty small and will be spread around pretty thin. That means us, Lavinia, us! Lavinia felt the hands tugging at her elbows on either side. Harold Lloyd in Welcome Danger, said the screen in the dark. Lavinia, Helen whispered. What? As we came in, a man in a dark suit across the street crossed over. He just came in. He sat in the road behind us. Oh, Helen, he's right behind us now, Lavinia looked at the screen. Helen turned slowly and glanced back. I'm calling the manager, she cried and she cried and leaped up. Stop the film, lights, Helen, come back, said Lavinia, her eyes shut. When they set down their empty soda glasses, each of the ladies had a chocolate mustache on her upper lip. They removed them with their tongues, laughing. You see how silly it was, said Lavinia, all that riot for nothing, how embarrassing. The drugstore clocks at 11.25, they had come out of the theater and the laughter and enjoyment feel and the laughter and enjoyment feeling new. They had come out of the theater and the laughter and the enjoyment feeling new. And now they were laughing at Helen and Helen was laughing at herself. L Lavinia said, when you ran up the aisle crying, lights, I thought I'd die. That poor man, the theater manager's brother from Racine. I apologize, said Helen. You see what panic can do? The great fans still whirred and wor still whirled and whirled in the warm night air stirring and re-stirring the smells of vanilla, raspberry, peppermint, and disinfectant in the drugstore. We shouldn't have stopped for those sodas, the police. The police said, oh, bosh, the police, laughed Lavinia. I'm not afraid of anything. The lonely one is a million miles away now. He won't be back for weeks, and the police will get him then. Just wait. Wasn't the film funny? The streets were clean and empty. Not a car or truck or a person was in sight. The bright lights were still lit in the small store windows where the hot wax dummies stood. Their blank blue eyes watched as the ladies walked past them down the night street. Do you suppose if we scream they do anything? Who? The dummies, the window people. Oh, Francine. Well, there were a hundred people in the windows, still and silent, and three people on the street, the echoes following like gunshots when they tapped their heels on the baked pavement. A red neon sign flickered dimly, buzzing like a dying insect. They walked past it. Baked and white, the long avenue lay ahead, blowing and tall in a wind that touched only their leafy summits. The trees stood on either side of the three small women. First, we'll walk you home, Francine. No, I'll walk you home. Don't be silly, you live the nearest. If you walked me home, you'd have to come back across the ravine all by yourself. And if so much as a leaf fell on you, you'd drop dead. Francine said, I can stay the night at your house. You're the pretty one. No. So they drifted like three prim clothes forms over a moonlit sea of lawn and concrete and trees to Lavinia, watching the black trees flit by, listening to the voices of her friends. The night seemed to quicken. They seemed to be running while walking slowly. Everything seemed fast in the color, in the color of hot snow. Let's sing, said Lavinia. They sang sweetly and quickly, arm in arm, not looking back. They felt the hot sidewalk cooling underfoot, moving, moving. Listen, said Lavinia. They listened to the summer night, to the crickets and the far-off tone of the courthouse clock, making it 15 minutes to 12. Listen, a porch swing creaked in the dark, and there was Miss, Mr. Uh, Mr. Turrell, silent, alone on his porch as they passed, having a last cigar. They could see the pink cigar fire idling to and fro. Now the lights were going, going, gone. The little house lights and the big house lights, the yellow lights and green hurricane lights, the candles and oil lamps and porch lights. Everything felt locked up in brass and iron and steel. Everything, thought Lavinia, is boxed and wrapped and shaded. She imagined the people in their moonlit beds and their breathing in the summer night safe and together, and here we are, she thought, listening to our solitary footsteps on the baked summer evening sidewalk, and above us, the lonely street lights shining down, making a million wild shadows. Here's your house, Francine. Good night. 
Lavinia, Helen, stay here tonight. It's late, almost midnight now. Mrs. Murdoch has an extra room. You can sleep in the parlor. I'll make hot chocolate. It'll be, it'll be ever so much fun. Francine was holding them both close to her. No, thanks, said Lavinia, and Francine began to cry. Oh, not again, Francine, said Lavinia. I don't want you dead, sobbed Francine, the tears running straight down her cheeks. You're so fine and nice. I want you alive. Please, oh, please. Francine, I didn't realize how much this has affected you, but I promise you I'll phone when I get home right away. Oh, will you? And tell you I'm safe, yes, and tomorrow we'll have a picnic lunch at Electric Park, all right? With ham sandwiches I'll make myself. How's that? You see, I'm going to live forever. You'll phone? I promised, didn't I? Good night, good night. Francine was gone behind her door, locked in tight in an instant. Now, said Lavinia to Helen, I'll walk you home. The courthouse clock struck the hour. The sounds went across the town that was empty, emptier than it had ever been before, over empty streets and empty lots and empty lawns. The sounds wet. Ten, eleven, twelve, counted Lavinia with Helen on her arm. Don't you feel funny? asked Helen. How do you mean? When you think of us being out here on the sidewalk, under the trees, and all those people safe behind locked doors, lying in their beds, we're practically the only walking people out in the open in a thousand miles, I bet. The sound of a deep, warm, dark ravine came near. In a minute, they stood before Helen's house, looking at each other for a long time. The wind blew the odor of cut grass and wet lilacs between them. The moon was high in the sky. It was high in a sky that was beginning to cloud over. I don't suppose it's any use asking you to stay, Lavinia. I'll be going on. Sometimes. Sometimes what? Sometimes I think people want to die. You've certainly acted odd all evening. I'm just not afraid, said Lavinia, and I'm curious, I suppose. And I'm using my head logically. The lonely one can't be around. The police and all. Our police? Our little old police force? Our, our little old force? They're home in bed, too. The cover's up over their ears. Let's just say I'm enjoying myself precariously but safely. If there were any real chance of anything happening to me, I'd stay here with you. You can be sure of that. Maybe your subconscious doesn't want you to live. Maybe your subconscious doesn't want you to live anymore. You and Francine, honestly. I feel so guilty. I'd be drinking hot cocoa just as you reach the. I'll be drinking hot cocoa just as you reach the ravine bottom and walk on the bridge, in the dark. Drink a cup for me. Good night. Lavinia Nebs walked down the midnight street, down the late summer night silence. She saw the houses with their dark windows, and far away she heard a dog barking. In five minutes, she thought, I'll be safe home. In five minutes, I'll be phoning silly little Francine. I'll... She heard the man's voice singing far away among the trees. She walked a little faster. Coming down the street toward her in the dimming moonlight was a man. He was walking casually. I can run, knock on one of those doors, thought Lavinia, if necessary. The man was singing Shine on Harvest Moon, and he carried a long club in his hand. Well, look who's here. What a time of night for you to be out, Miss Nebs. Officer Kennedy. And that's who it was, of course, Officer Kennedy on his beat. I'd better see you home. Never mind, I'll make it. But you live across the ravine. Yes, she thought, but I won't walk the ravine with any man. How do I know who the lonely one is? No, thanks, she said. I'll wait right here, then, he said. If you need help, give a yell. I'll come running. She went on, leaving him under a light, humming to himself alone. Here I am, she thought, the ravine. She stood on top of the thirty of the one hundred and thirty ah, the one hundred and thirteen steps down the street, down the steep brambled bank that led across the creaking bridge and up through the black hills to Park Street. The only one lantern to see, and only one lantern to see by. Three minutes from now, she thought, I'll be pushing my key. In my house door, nothing can happen in just 180 seconds. She started down the dark green steps into the deep ravine night. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine steps, she whispered. She felt she was running, but she was not running. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen steps, she counted aloud. The ravine was deep, black, and black, black. And the world was gone, the world of safe people in bed, the locked doors, the town, the drugstore, the theater, the lights, everything was gone. Only the ravine existed and lived. 
black and huge about her. Nothing's happened, has it? No one's around, is there? 24, 25 steps. Remember that old ghost story you told each other when you were children? She listened to her feet on the steps. The story about the dark man coming in your house and you upstairs in bed. And now he's on the first step coming up to your room. Now he's on the second step. Now he's on the third and fourth and fifth step. Oh, how you laughed and screamed at that story. And now the horrid dark man is on the twelfth step, opening your door and he's standing by your bed. I got you, she screamed. It was like nothing she'd ever heard that scream. She had never screamed that loud in her life. She stopped. She froze. She clung to the wooden banister. Her heart exploded in her. The sound of its terrified beating filled the universe. There, there, she screamed at herself. At the bottom of the steps, a man under the light. No, now he's gone. He was waiting there, she listened. Silence, the bridge was empty. Nothing, she thought, holding her heart. Nothing, fool. That story I told myself, how silly, what shall I do? Her heartbeats faded. Shall I call the officer? Did he hear my scream? Or was it only allowed to me? Was it really just a small scream after all? She listened. Nothing. Nothing. I'll go back to Helen's and sleep there tonight. But even while she thought this, she moved down again. No, it's near home now. 38, 39 steps. Don't fall. Oh, I am a fool. 40 steps, 41, almost halfway now. She froze again. Wait, she told herself. She took a step. There was an echo. She took another step, another echo, just a fraction of a moment later. Someone's following me, she whispered to the ravine, to the black crickets and the dark green frogs and the black stream. Someone's on the steps behind me. I don't dare turn around. Another step, another echo. Every time I take a step, they take one, a step and an echo. Weakly, she asked of the ravine, Officer Kennedy, is that you? The crickets were suddenly still. The crickets were listening. The night was listening to her. For a moment, all the far summer night meadows and close summer night trees were suspending motion. Leaf, shrub, star, and meadow grass had ceased their particular tremors and were listening to Lavinia Nebs's heart. And perhaps a thousand miles away across locomotive lonely country, in an empty way station, a lonely night traveler reading a dim newspaper under a naked light bulb might raise his head, listen, and think, what's that, and decide, only a woodchuck, surely beating a hollow log. But it was Lavinia Nebs. It was the heart of Lavinia Nebs. Faster, faster, she went down the steps. Run! She heard music. In a mad way, in a silly way, she heard the huge surge of music that pounded at her. And she realized as she ran, as she ran in panic and terror, that some part of her mind was dramatizing, borrowing from the turbulent score of some private film. The music was rushing and plunging her faster, faster, plummeting and scurrying down, down into the pit of the ravine. Only a little way, she prayed. 110, 11, 12, 13 steps to the bottom. Now run across the bridge. She spoke to her legs, her arms, her body, her terror. She advised all parts of herself in this white and terrible instant. Over the roaring creek waters on the swaying, almost alive bridge plank, she ran followed by the wild footsteps behind, with the music following too, the music shrieking and babbling. He's following, don't turn, don't look. If you see him, you'll not be able to move. You'll be frightened, you'll freeze. Just run, run, run. She ran across the bridge. Oh God, God, please let me get out. Please let me get up the hill. Now up, up the path, now between the hills. Oh God, it's dark and everything's so far away. If I screamed now, it wouldn't help. I can't scream anyway. Here's the top of the path. Here's the street. Thank God I wore my low-heeled shoes. I can run. I can run. Oh, God, please let me be safe. If I get home safe, I'll never go out again. I was a fool. Let me admit it, a fool. I didn't know what terror was. I wouldn't let myself think. But if you let me get home from this, I'll never go out without Helen or Francine again. Here's the street. Across the street now. She crossed the street and rushed up the sidewalk. Oh, God, the porch, my house. In the middle of her running, she saw the half-filled lemonade glass where she had left it hours before in the good, easy, la in the good, easy, lazy time. Left it on the railing. She wished she was back in that time now, drinking from it. The night still young and not begun. Oh, please, please give me time to get inside and lock the door and I'll be safe. She heard her clumsy feet on the porch. She felt her hands scrabbling and ripping at the lock with the key. She, turned, she heard her heart, she heard her inner voice screaming, the key fit. Unlock the door, quick, quick! She 
she, the door opened. Now inside, slam it, she slammed the door. Now lock it, bar it, lock it, she cried. Lock it tight. The door was locked and barred and bolted. The music stopped. She listened to her heart again and the sound of it diminishing in the silence. Home. Oh, safe at home. Safe, safe, safe and safe and safe at home. She slumped against the door. Safe, safe. Listen, not a sound. Safe, safe. Oh, thank God, safe at home. I'll never go out at night again. Safe. Oh, safe, safe home. So good, so safe. Safe inside. The door is locked. Wait, look out the window. She looked. She gazed out the window for a full half minute. Why, there's no one there at all. Nobody. There was no one following me at all. Nobody running after me. She caught her breath and almost laughed herself. It stands to reason if a man had been following me, he'd have caught me. I'm not a fast runner. There's no one on the porch or in the yard. How silly of me. I wasn't running from anything except me. The ravine was safer than safe. Just the same, though, it's nice to be home. Home's the really good, warm, safe place, the only place to be. She put her hand on the light switch and stopped. What? she asked. What? What? Behind her in the black living room, someone cleared his throat. And that's the end.